Um, next, uh, Dr. Uh, Dustin Carlson is going to come up and talk about uh, the use of the FLIP technology um, and where its role is in the uh, future of management of reflux and esophageal-based diseases. All right, thank you very much. And uh, again, I'd like to thank the AFS, really a, a wonderful group here and, uh, yeah, I think a wonderful mission that we're uh, all excited to be a part of. All right, so I was given this fun task of asking the question, will we flip in the future? And how to go next? All right, a couple of disclosures uh, that are relevant to this topic. And a fun question, because I get to pull out the crystal ball a bit uh, and try to look ahead to ask, will we flip in the future? Um, and the other uh, associated side question with this is, will we manometry in the future? Uh, so first we'll talk a little bit about what flip can do uh, and come back and address these questions toward the end. So first, what is flip? Uh, Catheter-based device that has a balloon uh, on the end of this catheter that can be placed through the mouth and positioned in the distal esophagus. So spanning the esophagogastric junction in the distal esophageal body produces this type of output in real time. So we see the waste at the EGJ, the distal esophageal body being represented here, and applies a technology called impedance planimetry, which is based on Ohm's law, measures 16 channels of diameter along the length of this balloon. Paired with a pressure sensor in the distal portion of this balloon that together, looking at this relationship, gives us this concept of distensibility. So this relationship between luminal geometry and distensive pressure. Now impedance planometry is actually not a new technology. This has been used dating back a couple decades and a couple studies from Satish Rao and Hans Regerson uh, back in actually the mid-90s used single sensor impedance planimetry in the esophagus. But over the last five to eight years, really some evolution of this technology, particularly recognizing that of these 16 diameters, if you look at the raw data here, you can see 16 dynamic changing in diameter over time. When applying a sophisticated algorithm to interpolate this, very similar, almost exactly similar as high resolution manometry to esophageal pressure topography, we now see esophageal diameter topography. And with this, in addition to seeing distensibility, at the esophageal gastric junction, at the distal esophageal body as it relates to EOE, we can also assess the contractile response to distension. And so this panometric evaluation of esophageal function, we've termed flip panometry. And even further now in the evolution, the updated display uh, available now uh, looks at this in real time, where we can see a normal control here during the time of endoscopy can actually see this normal response. You can see contractions occurring in the esophagus uh, as represented by the uh, reduction in diameter. You can see the EGJ opening up nicely. Uh, also can see that the esophageal body opens up representing normal distensibility of the distal esophageal body. This concept of normal has actually been a little bit of a limitation using flip over time. And part of this has to do with uh, varying reports over the last five to eight years using consistently different protocols, different measures. And so one of the things going forward, I think one of the things that we need to do as a group is have some standardization in how we're doing this flip study protocol. There recently was a group of gastroenterologists who got together, tried to come up with how we should standardize this, pro this protocol, and basically agreed upon these techniques, using, recognizing that there are two different flip catheters available that differ in size. The 16 centimeter uh, balloon allows Distens, uh, assessment of distensibility of the esophageal body, esophagogastric junction, uh, and contractility, whereas the eight centimeter really allows assessment of just the esophagogastric junction. In some of this disconnect in some of the previous data of normal, uh, especially of normal, uh, different volumes use different pressure references. And so now in using atmospheric pressure references, reflecting on consistent uh, distension volumes, consistent stimuli to look at the esophagogastric junction distensibility using the 60 ml fill volume uh, with the 16 centimeter balloon, 40 with the eight, recognizing that the maximum EGJ diameter can be assessed over the whole course of the study, and also seeing that you can assess contractility over the entire course of the 16 centimeter flip protocol. 
And so what is normal? Uh, and even before that, what is this main measure we're looking at? This EGJ distensibility index, uh, which actually is the, the narrowest cross-sectional area across the EGJ divided by the intra-balloon pressure. How that relationship of the sensibility is assessed at the EGJ. And now in 30 asymptomatic volunteers, we've used this standardized protocol, 60 centimeter balloon, 60 ml fill volume, to reflect these normal values of EGJ distensibility, distensibility index plotted here along the left, intra-balloon pressure along the, uh, the bottom here. And we see that the median value is about around six, uh, with over 90% of controls having a DI more than three, and none of them having a DI less than two. If we compare this with achalasia, we are looking at 70 patients with untreated achalasia. We see that the vast majority have a reduction in EGJ distensibility. 98% of these 70 uh, untreated achalasia patients had a DI less than three, and over 90% had a DI less than two. And recognizing here that the components of the EGJ DI, the cross-sectional area and the pressure, remain important. And even these few achalasia patients who do tend to track in that gray zone of two to three all had pressures less than 30 millimeters of mercury. So again, these composites uh, and using each factor uh, and looking at EGJ distensibility. Achalasia can, or the flip, can also be used to track therapy during the time of myotomy in achalasia. Borrowing some data from our excellent surgical group, from Eric Hungness and Dr. Teitelbaum, you see that the EGJ distensibility increases during the various stages of POEM. Similarly, see the EGJ increase during a laparoscopic heller myotomy, slight reduction at the time of the, the fundoplasty formation, uh, and again, reaching uh, an increase in the sensibility over the course of the operation. Further observational studies suggested that there may be a way to even tailor this myotomy and find this distensibility sweet spot, so to speak, where patients will have dysphagia resolved, but also potentially be at lower risk for, for reflux uh, at, after the, the operation. And if we look at EGJDI, we see that this is associated with reduced treatment outcomes among patients with achalasia. Here, good treatment response, EGJDIs tend to be in the, in the normal range, whereas those who have a poor treatment response look quite similar to untreated achalasia. And in several studies now, the EGJDI actually has carried a stronger association with outcome, both symptomatic and retention on barium esophagram, than manometric LES pressures. What about in GERD? This idea that an increased DI, potentially increased EGJ compliance, would predict abnormal acid exposure and reflux. However, data in GERD is a little less consistent. And a number of studies, some have been positive, some have been negative. I report the results of a study that we did here. We see actually looking at the EGJ DI along the y-axis, acid exposure time on wireless pH testing on the, on the x-axis here, and really a poor correlation. However, if you look at those who kind of fall into this upper limit of DI, kind of the, the reflux range, all of these patients included here all had abnormal acid exposure times with acid exposure times greater than six perhaps suggesting that maybe FLIP is a way to phenotype reflux patients and find this group here that has increased compliance and potentially uh, more susceptible to uh, improving after a, an LES-targeted uh, intervention. However, data here is, is needed to certainly support this speculation. Similarly, intraoperative use of endoflip has been used in fundal application and reported in multiple studies to be associated with a reduction in EGJ distensibility. Could this also be a tool to help tailor the fundal application? Again, find this distensibility sweet spot where dysphagia can be avoided, but reflux can still be controlled. This is an area that certainly requires future study, and I know uh, several folks in the room are actively doing studies looking at this, and I eagerly await the, the results of those studies. But beyond the measure of distensibility, FLIP does allow an evaluation of esophageal motility, because they see these patterns of a contractile response. And those, as we show with the asymptomatic control, there's a repetitive antegrade contractions. This is a pattern that is commonly seen in patients who have normal motility on manometry. In some patients, we see an absent contractile response. This is commonly the pattern that we see in patients with achalasia, especially type 1 and some type 2 achalasia. And finally, we see this interesting pattern of repetitive retrograde contractions. And this pattern is actually commonly seen in patients with type 3 achalasia, suggesting this may be 
a manifestation of spastic motor function. If we think about how we interpret high resolution manometry via the Chicago classification, we do so in a hierarchical manner. First assessing LES relaxation, then assessing the contractility pattern to ultimately yield a motility diagnosis. The same uh, paradigm can be applied to flip panometry to assess EGJ distensibility, looking at the distensibility index, looking at the max EGJ diameter, looking at this pattern of contractile uh, distension induced contractility, and ultimately yielding a panometry diagnosis. And here we can see disorders associated with EGJ outflow obstruction. We see major disorders of contractile response and potentially even a minor disorder of contractile response that may reflect ineffective esophageal motility. We tested such a, a scheme in, a, uh, in 145 patients who had non-obstructive dysphagia. And among those, just defining those per the Chicago classification as having major motor disorders, had the vast majority actually had a, an abnormal HRM. So clearly a bit of a referral bias in which of these patients were assessed both with manometry and endoflip. But among these patients with abnormal major motor disorders on high resolution manometry, 95% also had abnormal flip panometry. Only a few, a handful, did not. Those who had normal HRM, which included uh, four patients with IEM in addition to those with normal motility, actually found abnormalities on FLIP in 50% of patients. With this lone 72, or this lone 17, excuse me, having both normal manometry, normal FLIP. If we look back though at the group who had abnormal manometry and abnormal FLIP, this included all 70 of the patients with achalasia that we had included in this study, thus we concluded the flip panometry may effectively identify major motor disorders. This group who had a normal flip but had abnormal manometry, all five of these patients had the manometric diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction. We recognize that this is a problematic manometric diagnosis, and when we looked at these patients uh, and how they were treated, how they uh, coursed over the uh, short duration of follow-up, all of them had a very benign course, responded to conservative therapy, uh, and often had more of a, a clinical features uh, of functional dysphagia. So we concluded that flip panometry may help clarify some of these equivocal motility diagnoses. And finally, an interesting group here that had normal manometry but abnormal flip suggests that maybe flip can help detect some functional abnormalities that we miss on high resolution manometry. Just to show another study out of Amsterdam, looked at a group of patients who had suspected achalasia, but manometry missed it. All of these patients had normal IRPs, some even as normal as five millimeters of mercury or lower. All of these patients had an abnormal EGJDI on FLIP, and when they treated them all as achalasia with pneumatic dilation or heller myotomy, over three quarters improved. Again, kind of helping uh, support that FLIP may help clarify some of these times when manometry does not give us all the answers we're looking for. It is important to recognize, though, that what we're describing here is a relationship between FLIP panometry and high resolution manometry because FLIP panometry does not equal high resolution manometry, and they look at different things, different stimuli, different measurements. FLIP looks at diameters and the sensibility. Manometry looks at pressures. FLIP looks at the response to distension, somewhat uh, measures akin to secondary peristalsis, whereas manometry looks at the response to swallows and measures primary peristalsis. But we can make a comparison of these two things. And if we look at a few different components here, we look at tolerability. FLIP is done during a sedated endoscopy. There is no comparison that if you ask a patient, would they rather have a transnasal manometry or a FLIP while they are asleep, they always would prefer FLIP. From a time standpoint, FLIP takes four to six minutes. Manometry, 30 minutes. Now, that time with FLIP is during an endoscopy, so where the time falls down is, I guess, up to all of us to decide. From a cost standpoint, both carry some uh, upfront costs. Uh, but afterwards, if you think about FLIP and the reduction in clinic visits, potentially a reduction in manometry use, uh, there may be some cost savings here on the back side. From a diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction, the IRP as a single measure is problematic. FLIP may help clarify some of these patients. And if we look at the achalasia follow-up group, EGJ DI did have a better correlation with retentions and symptoms. Manometry does have some roles though. Manometry better helps subtype achalasia. We see differences across FLIP, but there's overlap. And so where this falls and how this helps phenotype patients is still something we need to explore. From a defining hypercontractility, defining spasm, manometry just has much more robust data among these rare motility dis uh, disorders. And so FLIP is still awaiting future study. From an outcome study standpoint, uh, really limited data in both. When you look at it, manometry 
uh, and outcome studies has not been robustly uh, reported uh, even over decades of use. Um, and from an analysis standpoint, FLIP is relatively easy. Pattern recognition, real-time output, um, but it still is, it's relatively new and still is awaiting uh, improved an analysis software. Uh, but lastly, I think if we look at the pun potential here, FLIP clearly is way better than, than manometry. And so, we turn to our question. Will we flip in the future? So I will flip to the next side to address that. And I think the answer is definitely yes. Flip has a role. Future study is certainly needed and where this role is is something that we'll clarify. Um, because when we look at it, will we manometry in the future? The answer is yes there too. And there are certainly times where we use these things together. And if we look at this flip panometry schema, a little complicated, but there are certainly times when clinically suspected achalasia, abnormal desensibility, absent contractile response, that is achalasia and may be able to be treated as such. Similarly, when flip is normal, that is likely going to be normal motility and manometry may not add all that much. Other cases, less clear clinical outcomes, manometry, maybe varying esophagram will help clarify these. This group where EGA desensibility is abnormal but the contractile response looks really robust and normal, this may indicate a subtle stricture and may be helped direct using dilation at the time of that endoscopy, potentially coming back to using manometry or esophagram in the future. Similarly, among manometry, if we've started with manometry, FLIP is going to be useful to help characterize some of these patients on the backside. EJ alpha obstruction, I think, being the primary group, but also potentially some of absent contractility, especially patients who don't have otherwise uh, connective tissue disease. Maybe somewhere in jackhammer esophagus, FLIP has a role to help subcharacterize patients. And those, especially with dysphagia, who have had a relatively benign manometry, there may be a role for FLIP here to help characterize and find an abnormality that may have otherwise been missed. So to conclude, FLIP panometry can effectively detect major motor disorders, including achalasia at the time of endoscopy, may help clarify some of these equivocal manometric diagnoses like easy outflow obstruction. Um, there may be a role here to help define the anti-reflux barrier, though I think that this requires future study. Um, and ultimately, because FLIP is completed during a sedated endoscopy, it certainly is well tolerated, it's convenient to both the patient and provider, and it may help direct intervention at the time of endoscopy. With that, I'll conclude, and certainly thank you for your attention.